Welcome back to Negotiations as Process. We're in Chapter 4 this week, Strategy and Planning. Goals focus your strategy. Can't put it any simpler than that. So step one is determining the goals for the negotiation process. Where, to, where do you want to be at the end of the negotiation? Negotiators should specify goals and objectives clearly. If things are muddled, you're going to get muddled results. And the goals have direct and indirect effect on what your strategy is going to be. On the direct side, wishes are not goals. Now, those of you who've just had me for strategic planning, this is a little simplistic for you, but wishes are not goals. Goals are often linked to the other party's goals. There are limits to what goals can be, and effective goals must be concrete and specific. If they're not specific, they won't be effective. Indirect effects of setting goals includes relationship development. And there may be something else, some other things you can think of based on your life. Strategy versus tactics. Strategy is the overall plan to achieve one's goals in a negotiation. Tactics are the short-term adaptive moves designed to enact or pursue broad strategies. Tactics are always subordinate to the strategy. And tactics are driven by the strategy. Planning is the action component of the strategy process. How will I implement the strategy? We say here's the goals. But if you set goals and don't map out a path to get there, again, as you learn from those of you who just had me in strategic planning, you're not going to get there. There are two approaches. Unilateral, we do it by ourselves without active involvement of the other party. And bilateral, we consider the impact of both sides. Uh, and we consider the other strategy. I mean, while you're planning a strategy for a negotiation, you understand that whoever's on the other side of the table is also planning a strategy. Again, the dual concerns model comes up, and there are four things that happen here. Avoidance, where the outcome is not important about the relationship, and the outcome of the organization or the need, the goal, is not important. Well, then we've got avoidance. In competition, I gain, and you lose, and I ignore the relationship factor because I don't care. We're, ever, we're never going to be doing business again in the first place. In collaboration, I gain, you gain, we enhance the relationship because there's a good chance we're going to be back doing business again together in the future. Plus, you'll achieve better outcomes. And when you're accommodating, I let you win and enhance the relationship because maybe the goal is for me is to enhance the relationship more than it is to achieve resource or financial gain out of the negotiation. That's entirely a legitimate strategy. Strategic options are reflected in the answers to two questions. How much concern do I have in achieving my desired outcomes in this negotiation? And how much concern do I have for the current and future quality of the relationship with the other party? You have to reconcile those two and figure out where outcome and relationship fit in terms of the overall plan. Avoidance is a non-engagement strategy, and it's very simple. If I'm able to meet my needs without negotiating at all, it why should I negotiate with you if there's nothing in it for me? There's no possible gain. It's not worth the time and the effort. And maybe there's available alternatives to what I need to achieve without negotiating anything. Active engagement includes three different levels. Competition, which is the distributive win-lose bargaining kind of scenario. We've talked about it before. Zero sum, not good. Collaboration is integrative negotiation and win-win. And accommodation involves an imbalance of outcomes, I lose, you win. But again, sometimes that may be the choice that you make because the relationship is more important than the short-term financial or resource gain. There are seven ideal phases in negotiation. Preparation, you've got a plan for where you're going to get to. Building the relationship with the other party. Gathering data for both your organization and on the other party. Using that data within the negotiation to emphasize your points and de-emphasize their points, the bidding process where we go back and forth, the closing up of the argument and the final agreement that comes to give us the desired outcomes, and then the actual implementation. You can come to an agreement, but if nobody actually acts upon it afterwards, it wasn't any good, as we've studied in strategic planning where they sit on the shelf. The ideal key phases, again, if we break them down and the preparation, you need to know what your goals are and how you're going to work in the relationship with the other party. 
You're going to work on relationship building. There are differences between you and similarities between you. If you overemphasize the differences, you'll have problems. If you find the similarities, then you'll have grounds you can work on. And building together on both sides of the negotiation, commitment to the desired outcomes. Information gathering, you learn what you need to know and what you need to know about the issues. In using data, we're assembling our case. In bidding, each party states their opening offer, and then each party engages in give and take back and forth until we finally close the deal, build commitment, and then implement the agreement across the organizations or between the parties. And again, we just look at that graphic of the seven phases, preparation, relationship building, data gathering, data using, bidding, closing, and implementation. When you're planning your strategy, both in terms of the outcomes and the process that will take place of the negotiation, you need to define the issues and assemble the issues and define the bargaining mix, which is very simply just combining that list of issues and deciding which one has priorities. You need to define your interests in this negotiation. Why do we want what we want as an outcome? In planning the strategy, you need to know your limits and the alternatives. What's the least we can accept? What are the other options that we might run into? Set your objectives, your targets, and your opening bids, where you're going to start. Your target is the outcome that you realistically expect. You can't expect to get everything, though some folks do. And opening is the best that can be achieved to start with, and you hope to settle somewhere in the middle. And you assess the constituents, the parties, the people who are involved, and the social context of the negotiation. That's why in week one you were asked to do some research on body language. Constantly paying attention to who's speaking, who's listening, how they're talking, their eye movement, their note-taking, their legs crossed, their arms folded, the interaction among the negotiators. This graphic is on page 104 as a figure 4.3 in your text as an arena-like facility where, you know, games take place because it is partially game theory. The direct actors on our side are A, while the direct actors on the other side are the Bs. C are the indirect actors, and there are some for both of us. Now, these would, in general, we'd think about stakeholders, we've talked about them before, who have influence on the sidelines for both parties. D are interested observers. Now, those may be stakeholders with little influence, outside pundits who need something to write about or talk about in their media outlets, among other possible stakeholders. And finally is E, the environmental factors outside the negotiation, but with definite impact on shaping what happens in the arena. And in the global marketplace today, it has to be considered. If you're working for a nonprofit organization, for instance, the mandates, the funding changes that are continually going on are highly important when it comes to things like mergers and acquisitions or taking over a program that another entity has been offering to the community beforehand. As we're planning our strategy, you've got to analyze your opponent, not only before you get to the table, But once you get to the table, what's the reason that they have their objectives, the goals that they've set? Why do they want what they want? And you have to present a clear case refuting their position. This is debate. If you can't make effective arguments suggesting why they need to pay attention to your position as opposed to their position, you're going to get walked on. And then you're going to present, of course, your issues to the other party, both your concerns and the outcomes indirectly that you're trying to get to. It's a negotiation process. We don't come out and say, I've got to have X tomorrow or we're done. You won't be negotiating anymore. Some of the information that you absolutely must have, the resources, the issues, and the bargaining mix. You must understand what resources are on the table. And resources is a very broad term, and it's meant to be. The interests and the needs of both sides. The walk-away point. Is there a point in the negotiation where we absolutely cannot do this anymore and we just have to walk away because their demands are too excessive. And that comes. And the alternatives to finishing the negotiation. If we're walking away, there must be an acceptable alternative. And we want to know that before we get into the negotiation too far into it. Who the constituents, the parties are, the folks involved, the social structure, and the authority to make an agreement. If I don't have the people who have the authority to make a decision at the table, then we've got something else we need to work on. The reputation of the other party and their negotiation style. How do they like to work? And the likely strategy and tactics that they might take, as well as deciding what ones you're going to take. You need to define the negotiation protocol, as it will, the process. What's the agenda? 
Who's going to be there? Where will the negotiation occur? What is the time period that it's going to take place? And I don't mean just we're going to meet from two to five, but a negotiation rarely happens and concludes in one session. So is there a length of weeks, month? Are we going to meet biweekly? How long is it going to take completely? What's going to happen if the negotiation fails? How will we keep track of what's agreed to? And how do we know whether or not we have good agreement? You have to sort through all these issues before you get to the table and be continually adjusting, again, just like a game of chess. So once again, your assignments for this week, and you are already right on track because you've just finished watching the video. Read chapter four, continue your journaling. You need to post in the discussion thread what your major topic's going to be. You need to take the chapter four quiz, and you need to smile and breathe. And if you have any questions or concerns, you need to contact me, and I will solve them for you as best as possible. It might be a negotiation. So wake up, as it were. Planning is the most critical, important activity in negotiation. It is also one of the most important activities of all within our organization. So often, though, the planning and the strategy don't actually have an implementation. With this, you should. Because if you don't know where you're going, you're probably end up there. Thanks for listening. Have a great week. I'll see you in class next week.